Tonight on Mississippi Roads, we're traveling to Como, a little town in northern Mississippi. We'll hear from some ladies whose music can really touch the soul and the interesting way they were discovered. And we'll take a look at a peaceful cemetery right in the middle of a busy city. And finally, we'll look into why the Como Steakhouse draws crowds from miles and miles away. Support for the arts segment of Mississippi Roads comes from the Mississippi Arts Commission, whose mission is to be a catalyst for the arts and creativity in Mississippi. Information available at www.arts.ms.gov. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Down Mississippi Roads. But if you ever traveled I-55 North, you may have seen the exit for the tiny town of Como, Mississippi. And you've probably been in too big a hurry to get on up to Memphis or wherever else you were going to take the time to peel off and take a look around. But I think in the next few minutes, you're gonna find out lots of reasons that next time you're this way, take a few minutes and come on downtown and see what there is in Como. Como is a town of a little over 1,300 people nestled away in Panola County. The town has actually seen a few of its residents go on to big things. Luther Perkins, a guitarist for Johnny Cash, grew up here. And Jimbo Mathis, founder of the 90s swing band, the Squirrel Nut Zippers, has his recording studio here. That's a lot of talent for a small town to offer up. And speaking of talent, we found an interesting tale of three ladies here locally who are making a big splash musically, and the surprising way they were discovered. You know, down, down in Mississippi and in that area, gospel is, is big, um, but it doesn't usually sound like what, what they're doing. Um, it usually has a big, giant band and um, is a little bit more melodramatic, in my opinion. Uh, this, this stuff is just, I don't know, it just gets you. They instill these renditions of old traditional songs with, um, with an optimism uh, and honesty that's just fantastic. Just all, really always have been around music. And to me, it's just in my soul to sing. And whenever the, the, uh, uh, the Lord, the anointing come upon, it's like, I just want to sing to the power of glory come down in till I can feel it. And when I feel that spirit, I know that from the heart reaches the heart. And I just love singing and I just thank God that this opportunity came for us to be able to be the come on mama because this is like a dream come true. That dream materialized in an unusual way. You see, the Como Mama's grandfather, Miles Pratcher, was recorded by folklorist Alan Lomax in 1959. And the Alan Lomax connection brought some filmmakers down to Como in search of musical talent, which just happened to be one of the Como Mama's sons. But fate took an unusual twist once the filmmakers arrived in Como. And finally one day we saw this uh, van coming in and we thought, wow, you know, and when they got out and told us who they were, we couldn't believe it. Of course, with Angela's son being a teenager, at that time his little group had broke up because by that time they had finished school. They were, they were trying to rap when they all was in school together. Well, at the time they had finished high school and they, everybody had kind of gone their separate ways. And so he told me, he said, well, I sang with another rap group ain't there. I said, well, go get them. Go get, you know, the ones you sang with. And so Angela and I made up, what can we do to try to keep them here? We want to keep these guys here until he get back. So we, we told Michael, we said, we sing. You know, and he said, well, let me hear you all. And so we sung this song by Shirley Caesar, Oh, It Is Jesus. And um, so when he heard us, he said, I wish I could hear y'all's grandfather, Miles Pratchett. I told him, I said, well, I know somebody that have a copy of the CD. And so I called Esther and told Esther to bring the CD down. So when Esther came down with the CD, we told him, said, she sang too. He said, well, let us hear all three of you all. And so when we sung, he said he was just really uh, 
amazed at how different our voices were. The voices were perfectly matched. You know, Esther was this big, giant, you know, gruff, like passionate front voice. And then um, the other two complemented perfectly. Angela, uh, the youngest, she's kind of a low, round voice. And the other was uh, uh, Della had this kind of high pitched voice and it just, it just blended perfectly. It instantly gave, gave us chills up the spine, so it was, it was unbelievable. These three powerful voices provided the only instrumentation heard on the Como Mama songs. You know, a lot of the singing now have the music with it, and sometimes the music is so loud you really can't un understand what they're saying. You, you really kind of get bits and pieces of what's being said in the song. And, you know, we just always sort of felt like that. People need to hear. Some songs you'll never forget. Some words you'll never forget. And that's one reason why we sang those old songs, because we know those songs touch people. Never let me down. He just a jewel. He just a jewel. Yeah. And I found. Growing up poor, and in the midst of segregation has only strengthened the resolve of these women and made them thankful for where they are today. I can remember we had so much cotton, 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 and then I can remember being able to pick 200 pounds of cotton a day. Our clothes that my mom made, me and my sister, she would take the flower sack when they get flour, she would take that and make us dresses. That's how we had dresses to wear and we would get one pair of shoes, and you would have to, when you go to school and you come back, we would have to get out of those shoes and go bare feet it to make the shoes last longer. So I remember those big signs being everywhere in Kobo, white only, that you couldn't use this restroom. So my mother had to take a jug of water with her. So if I wanted some water, I could get some of her water that she brought with her. So, you know, growing up in Como was, was good, but I also remember the time that we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that. And now I remember, now, you know, if I want, whatever I want to eat, whatever I want to wear, whatever I want to, you know, wherever I want to go, I can do it. And to not be thankful, you know, that is just in our songs. That's why we sing so hard, because we know where God has brought us. known for the steakhouse. Whenever you say something about Como mm -hmm. and this you say steakhouse, everybody knows that you're talking about the steakhouse. Yes. But we want Como to be known for more than just the steakhouse. Mm -hmm. We want Como to be known for the Como Mamas. Como Mamas. And we want, Como when somebody Mamas. say Como Mamas, we want them to know what they're talking about. Um, it's, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. And I've lived here all my life and I've never eaten in there. <laughs> <laughs> just looking for my childhood coming up and the changes has been made here. I just love Como, and I think this is a place that I'll stay until the good Lord call me home. Daptone Records recorded the Como Mama's first CD at the rural Mount Moriah CME Church. Those simple a cappella recordings have thrown these ladies into the proverbial spotlight. And I need you, Jesus, every day to walk with me. Um, they also have just an incredibly positive uh, vibe, a good vibe. They love people. Um, I noticed at this last show that I saw them at, and at South by Southwest in Austin, they're just, uh, they're really engaging their uh, viewers now and talking to them and, I don't know, it's just a real nice vibe. They, they're just a real honest, cool group of ladies. We are 
so blessed. We're so blessed. And like I say, it's just happening so fast. I mean, we're not rich, but we're but we're rich in spirit. And I think that's what people like like about the couple moms too. We don't drive fancy cars and we don't have on all the jewelry that people might hang out down your neck, but we are rich in spirit and we try to show it with our smiles and we try to touch people hard when we talk to them and, and I just think that God has really blessed us. Well, matter of fact, I know God has blessed us. And I just hope that people continue to feel that from us. Feel the love and the warmth that we all have inside of us. Lead me down, down by the river side. Of Jesus. Of Jesus. Oh, oh, my oh, my I enjoy knowing that I'm living my life on doing what God wants me to do. He put me down here to grow, glorify him. When we get up on that stage, you know, everybody kind of be looking like, what we have here, you know, what, what is this, you know? And when, then when they hear us sing, the reaction that come on their face, when our voice be in harmony together, the, I enjoy seeing the expression on people's face that they can't believe that's coming out of our mouth, you know? <laughs> they can't believe the harmony that they're hearing. And it makes me feel good because I enjoy knowing in my heart that only what you do for Christ is going to last. I may do a whole lot of things in my life, but only what I do for Christ is going to follow me from this earth all the way to heaven. Como is one of those little southern towns where time seems to slow down the instant it hits the town limits. Maybe that's what's given people the opportunity here to develop their skills and hone their talents. The town itself dates back to the early 1830s, when a man settled here and bought some large tracts of land. The government wanted to put a railroad through his property on the way south from Memphis. And they needed a name for the place, so the man who bought the land called it Como, after Lake Como in Italy. And through the years, the town has seen its share of both struggles and growth. And right now, the town seems to be growing like never before. There are new restaurants popping up, and there are bed and breakfasts too. And all this growth comes while Como holds on to a look that calls back memories of an idyllic time long ago. Now, folks here in Como says the town has something special that you won't find in a lot of other places in Mississippi, or even in the nation for that matter, and that is a true sense of family in that lots of families have lived in Como for over 100 years, making the town more of a family than a town. Because of the way the local economy stopped relying on the cotton industry, a lot of jobs left the area. The folks who stayed behind were too poor to move. And then something interesting happened. When people have enough time on their hands, they start making things, creating. The residents of Como took advantage of the free time to express themselves and use the peace and quiet to change Como's economic course into one that's based off of creativity. And while we're taking the time to enjoy the peace and quiet and slow pace of Como, let's go to another very peaceful place that's right in the middle of the bustle of a big city. Some of Mississippi's most iconic landmarks are in downtown Jackson. The state's first skyscrapers are there and some of the oldest buildings in the state. Three of them are well-known antebellum buildings, the old capital where the vote for Mississippi to secede from the Union was taken. Jackson's City Hall, whose third floor is actually a Masonic Hall, and the Mississippi Governor's Mansion. Only one other older Governor's Mansion in the nation is still in use. But as beautiful and as historic as these buildings may be, None of these are Jackson's oldest existing landmark. That would be this, Greenwood Cemetery. It dates from the earliest days of the city and was already in use when any of the buildings still standing were constructed. The state legislature passed an act establishing Greenwood Cemetery in 1823. It's grown from its original six acres to 22 acres today. And a pretty good cross section of Jackson is buried here. It was never segregated. If you died in Jackson, you got buried here. Cecile Ward Law is with the Greenwood Cemetery Association, which is the volunteer group, which pretty much looks after the cemetery. There were no, no sections for 
any groups. Um, we didn't have Catholics and Protestants. We didn't have blacks and whites. Everybody just got buried. Tell me about the, uh, the people buried here. Who, who are some of our notables? Well, we have seven governors. We have um, Confederate generals. We have a Confederate section, and we did survey that. And um, there's some evidence of mass graves in that area. Um, when you walk around, you see the names of people that things in Jackson are named for. At work day, a couple of weeks ago, we had descendants from two elementary school namesakes, the Frenches and the Spans. And I just saw Mr. Fondren's name over there. So it's streets and, and schools and just familiar names in Jackson are buried here. The antique roses are a relatively new addition, although you see such roses in cemeteries all over the South, especially in places famous for them, like Natchez City Cemetery. These are a recent addition and are a thoughtful gift from gardening guru Felder Rushing. He went to the Antique Rose Emporium in Texas, and instead of getting a fee, he came back with a truck and trailer load of roses, and he did that two or three years, and the master gardeners helped him plant them. As with other establishments, the use of the cemeteries changed over the years. Well, it's always been a place for burying the dead, but people used to come here a lot, and not all that long ago, especially on Sunday afternoons. Before the days of cable TV and the easing of the blue laws, you didn't have many options for Sunday afternoon entertainment. My mother grew up in Jackson and she said that they would come on Sunday afternoon. It was, the, the churches were pretty strict about what you could do socially on Sundays, but you could certainly come to the cemetery and you could even bring lemonade and cookies um, and visit with your ancestors and your neighbors and their ancestors. Fixtures like the summer house in the cemetery were built to accommodate strollers who wanted shelter from the heat or needed a place to dodge a sudden thunderstorm. Writer Eudora Welty took many of her memorable photographs of some of the monuments in the cemetery. There are a number of monuments that lend themselves to photography, especially if you're attracted, as I am, to pretty much any cemetery you can walk out of. And as an added bonus to photographers and literary buffs alike, one of the markers in the cemetery the cemetery she used to love to photograph, is Eudora Welty's. Eudora Welty is buried here, and we have lots of, of travelers, tourists who come to see Eudora's grave. Her photograph is on the front of our brochure. She did that photograph for us. And this angel is still here, minus her, her hand, which we have, and we'll get it attached someday. That was um, when the big oak tree fell, this angel was just wrapped in the arms of the tree and lifted down to the ground. And her only injury was that her wrist broke. And there's lots more not to miss here. You can take a self-guided walking tour by picking up a copy of that brochure. The brochure is on the, the, in the little holder on the summer house. When you, walk, when you drive in, you can stop and pick up a brochure and it has a map and identifies many of the most interesting and the most beautiful monuments here because we, it's, just, it's like an art gallery. The, beautifully hand-carved marble monuments throughout the cemetery. Cemeteries have always been for the living. The dead buried here couldn't care less how decorated the place it is. And Greenwood cemeteries come back alive, as it were, over the past few years, especially as living in downtown Jackson has come into fashion. It's downtown Jackson's largest green space. And we want, we want everybody to think of it as a beautiful park. So with lots of people working downtown and taking lunchtime walks here and people living downtown also utilizing it, Greenwood Cemetery, once again, is one of downtown Jackson's most popular areas, and not just for Sunday afternoons anymore. We're in one of the bed and breakfast in Como. This is the Como Inn. It's downtown, located over what used to be a department store downstairs. The bed and breakfast industry here is a part of what gives this town its unique character and attracts people here. And it's also a pretty good indication of how you're going to get treated when you come here, too, with a lot of warmth and hospitality. And Como is one of those towns that it's impossible to get lost in. It only covers less than two square miles, so it's worth taking the time just to walk around and meet some of the people who live here and see just how beautiful it really is. Parts of it are reminiscent of the grandeur of New Orleans while others take every advantage of the wide open spaces to hold huge courtyards and beautiful architecture. And it's not just the bed and breakfast or the beauty of the town that attracts people here, but it's one of the absolute best steakhouses you'll find anywhere right here in Como. It's 
It's a great dining experience. You are getting a really fresh cut steak every time you come to the Como Steakhouse. But I think finally, and most important is, you're getting a lot of bang for your money. You really are. I mean, you're getting a great meal for your money. To get to that great meal, you might have to drive a little ways, but good things do come to those who wait. Just ask Richard King and Gary May. They're the third owners of the popular Como Steakhouse, which first opened back in 1988. The gentleman that opened it up was a gentleman named Paul Beavers. And um, Paul actually worked for um, the uh, butcher shop. And he went to him and asked if he could uh, consider maybe putting in a steakhouse of his own. And they said, certainly, as long as it's, it's you know, within an hour's drive of, of our nearest butcher shop. And so long and short of it, he did his demographics. Um, Como was wet at that time. And, um, and uh, Senatobia, Tate County, was not wet. And he just thought that, you know, a, a, a nice wine and a good steak, and people will come. And, uh, and he was right. He was. And come they have. Because of its popularity, you might have to wait a little to get a table at this bustling business. I have customers that will call me and ask me what the wait's going to be, and I really have a hard time giving them, a, you know, a, an accurate answer. But uh, we only take reservations for parties of eight or more on Friday and Saturday nights. And usually the wait time is not much more than 30 minutes, although I've seen those nights where you had to wait an hour or longer. It is worth the wait because of the juicy steak. All of our steaks are, are hand cut, which is so unusual today. Most steakhouses are buying their steaks pre-cut. And we cut all of our own steaks. Every steak we have, we, we pre-cut. Uh, uh, even the bone-in ribeye, the cowboy cut, as they call it in some places. They've been aged 27 days before we get them, and we hand cut them that day. We're grilling that steak on a charcoal open pit grill. Not too many steakhouses are using an open pit grill. There's not very many out there that are doing that. And that open pit really does help to give a tremendous amount of flavor to your steaks. So I think those two things in particular really distinguish us from other steakhouses. Flavor wise, and by charcoal and gas, you know, you really don't get no flavor with gas. Charcoal get a little more flavor with it. Saying we go through anywhere from about five to six hundred pounds of charcoal a week. Got all those steaks over there, and I've, I've ordered medium, which is pink in the center, and it's always that way. I don't know how to work it. And he's cooking. I can't cook four steaks the way people want it. I don't know how he does it. It's part of the entire dining experience that you get here is you see, you know, you ask yourself, man, how is that guy cooking all those steaks and getting them all the right way? And it really is a show to see. And if you've never seen it, it's an experience. I wonder how that guy knows exactly how to cook your steak, <laughs> but he does. <laughs> I've just been doing it a lot of years, and I love cooking. And I just, it's, just, it's just in me because I married a lady and she can't cook, so I do all the cooking at home. Patrons have been known to drive for hours to get a bite of the perfectly cooked steaks at the Como Steakhouse. It's about the fourth, fifth year we've been down here. We were coming back from uh, Mallard Point one time, was looking for a place to eat. The lady said, there's a good steakhouse here. Where it's told us where it's at, we've come down here and eat. We've been coming down here ever since. Como Steakhouse couldn't make it if, if it was just dependent on, you know, it's local. You know, I mean, we have to have people from Oxford, from Tunica, from Clarksdale, from Memphis, from Germantown. I had a couple um, um, uh, two weeks ago that literally drove all the way from Jackson because they'd heard about us. And they came, they ate, and then they drove all the way back to Jackson, you know. I feel like I ought to comp their, their meals and they do that, but I can't do that, you know. So you ought to see the to-go boxes that end up going out of here on Friday and Saturdays, not Saturday nights. I mean, they can't eat all the food we're giving them, you know. Best steak I've ever had. It's awesome. <laughs> But it's more than the steaks that continues to attract customers to this restaurant housed inside a 125-year-old former mercantile store. The servers and the atmosphere, you can't underestimate how important they are at this restaurant. I mean, really, because without that, it's just another steak. You, know, you can go to a lot of steakhouses and have a lot of steaks, but the servers and the atmosphere make, make the restaurant. People want to drive to the Como Steakhouse. Number one, if you've been here, you know you're going to get a great dining experience. And number two, you want to go home and t t tell a friend or tell a couple. 
you know, and all of a sudden they want to all get in the car and, and come to Como to eat at the Como Steakhouse. So it is, it's the whole evening experience of coming to Como, visit, visiting our stores, visiting our, our retail shops, our antique stores, uh, the art gallery, dining at the Como Steakhouse, taking in the entire Como, to be honest with you. It is a really, really nice evening, it is. If you'd like more information about anything you've seen in tonight's show, go to mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads, or join us on Facebook. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Meet me at the river, down by the river side. Meet me, meet me, meet me at the river. Mississippi Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.